we're going to um, go through it's pronounced Petra okay <laughs> okay thank you very much <laughs> uh, the a e is sometimes pronounced going to run through um, a series of cases uh, hopefully I'll get through it quite quickly and so will you um, and maybe we can take some more general questions if you have them towards the end of the session so I hope you have pen and paper do you all have pen and paper there to write things down all your answers if you could put into the uh, chat box any queries put into the chat box and I will try and address them um, there's also an assessment, a feedback uh, that you should try and complete to see how we can improve things. If you think I need improving, be very happy to learn how um, and uh, we'll crack on. OK, any any other questions, any concerns before we carry on? All happy? Smiley face happy? Yeah. Yeah, we've we got people joining us. OK. OK, we're going to talk a little bit about foreign bodies in ears. Quite a common problem, but there are particular age groups and individuals in which it presents. So can we try and answer question A first? You can see the two foreign bodies on the left, which we'll come to in a minute. So what age groups are you likely to find uh, uh, problems and what particular individuals kids and the elderly okay um children yep children in particular farina disabled is a bit more specific than disabled homeless okay ollie that's not yep the, mentally impaired farina yep okay so we say people with psychiatric illnesses or disorders um, who who end up putting things in their ears or trying to clean their ears unnecessarily. So children and people with some sort of psychiatric illness are common. And then it'll be others who are obsessed with de-waxing their ears. And there's a fair a number of the population who are like that. So what percentage of um, as a what percentage of people end up using matchsticks and buds for cleaning their ears because their natural wax extrusion is quite poor hence they end up with you or with me so just just as an aside what percentage is the general uh, wax extrusion not very good population wise do you think Anybody have a go at a percentage of 65 million people in the UK? How many have slightly tardy wax extrusion necessitating, as far as they're concerned, sticking things in their ears to take things out, which they might lose? More than 50 percent. Dr. Morali, I, I wish it was more than 50 percent. I'd be a multi-billionaire by now in private practice. Yeah, it's single digit figures, not quite 1%. It's probably nearer 4 or 5% of the population. So in a, in a population of 65 million, what are you looking at 5%? About 3 million people. So you'll see these in general practice on a regular basis, okay? So the other individuals that present are those that are obsessed with de-waxing their ears. Remember, if you see wax just in the contour of the ear canal, that's where it's supposed to come out. Frequently, you don't see wax that's come out. Um, I have slightly waxy ears, but it all tends to come out in the concha. I don't poke my ears around. OK, so what are the key symptoms of a foreign body? How do these present, do you think? Let's go with children first. How do you think children present foreign body? OK, the child may be only two years old. They can't express themselves, but pain is an issue. If they're a bit older, it may be painful. But what is more likely? 
if they put in their ears something like this, doesn't look very painful, this, still a foreign body. Okay, it's witnessed by parents, they might cry. And what else, what else help? Yeah, okay, they may, yeah, ear tugging. The other big, big ear tugging, yeah, because it's uncomfortable. What else might a um, corrosive foreign body produce then in the ear? Supposing they put a battery in their ear. Yeah, that you may have discharge, it may be bleeding. So with, uh, with, with children in particular, the parents have noticed they've stuck something in their ear. They may have seen them playing around with little beads and things and they've stuck it in there. They also stick it up their nose, of course. Um, and uh, or they've noticed a horrible stench and discharge from the ear and the kid may be a little bit grumpy and may even be in pain. So that's the way it tends to present in in children. What about adults? The psychiatrically ill are probably similar to children. Otherwise, those are de-waxing their ears with cotton buds and matchsticks and hairpins and things. Uh, will present um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a slightly different way. Adults, they'll give you a classical history, of course. Okay, so I've got two foreign bodies here. How do you think you might remove foreign body A? It's solid. It's roundish. How do you think you might? You might be able to get a right-angled hook. Okay. Uh, St. Bart's hook it is called, okay, or you just gently get it behind and pull it forward. You'll only be able to have one attempt because it can be quite painful as you, if you scrape the external meatus or you put too much pressure on the foreign body, it can be very painful. So you might use a right-angled hook. If you don't have a right-angled hook, how else might you do it? What other method do you have? Anybody? No, we're looking at, we're just doing a foreign body A first, Petra. So forceps, you could use forceps, those that have teeth. The trouble with a round foreign body is that if you try and grab it with the forceps, it tends to spring away. If you ever <laughs> shake it out, okay. Okay, so forceps, uh, uh, somebody mentioned, you have to be extremely careful because it's liable to just come out of the jaws of the forceps, okay? Particularly if it's a round, solid foreign body. Hooks are better if you can get behind it. Irrigation or syringing, Aleem, that's a good idea if you've got that facility. You can use a Higginson syringe, that's those massive syringes, point it in the right direction. You don't want to uh, point the uh, nozzle directly onto the foreign body because it'll just push it further back. You need to direct it uh, posteriorly, superiorly, so the water jet goes behind the foreign body and pushes the foreign body out. Obviously, always inspect after a, a syringing that you've actually got the foreign body out. Okay. What sort of foreign body should you not use syringing in? Or be wary of syringing the foreign body? A battery, okay. Anything else? Any organic substance, vegetables and things, because if you can't get the vegetable out, the water will absorb, be absorbed by the vegetable or the organic material, and it will expand and cause more dramatic symptoms. So generally avoid irrigation or syringing with organic or plant-based uh, uh, foreign bodies. Okay. One seeds, yep, seeds is a possibility. You've got to make sure you get the seed out, otherwise it will germinate in your ear. Well, I'm being a bit facetious. The seed will expand. 
okay? What other method might you use on this foreign body A? One other method, which is usually very effective, very quick, if you have the equipment and the facilities. Yeah, you, yes, it, Petra, you can use suction. You may just be able to use a headlight. If you've got a decent headlight and a speculum, you may be able to use a suction. And it's usually very, very straightforward. OK, um, but as I say, if you fail an attempt and cause pain, do not persist. Let somebody else have a go. And very rarely you might need a general anesthetic to take a foreign body out. OK, but don't try and persist because it is very, very painful because the external meatus is a highly innovated area. Remember, it's an erogenous zone. You know, if somebody tickles your ear, it's very, very beautiful, very nice. So it's also, as a consequence, very painful if you irritate the external meatus. Okay, what about foreign body B? How would you remove foreign body B? This is clearly an insect. Uh, this would cause huge distress to individual. This is buzzing away in the ear. Okay, how are you going to remove this? How you kill it, Ollie? Drown it in olive oil. Okay, yeah, the easiest thing is if you've got olive oil to hand or anything like that, if you don't have olive oil, you can use um, hair gel, whatever, something to to drown it. Water tends not to be that effective because they splash around with their wings and it may not kill it. So you want to kill it so it, 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 it minimizes or abolishes the huge noise distress that individuals get and then you can syringe or suction it okay now sometimes the individual claims they have inserted a foreign body you look in their ear cursory glance and there's no foreign body how might you be wrong if you say there isn't a foreign body because you need to look in a specific area in the external meatus where the foreign body may have lodged out of sight. Do you know what that area is called? So there's a little area in the external meatus where foreign bodies can lodge, small foreign bodies, small seed, or a small uh, piece of jewellery or a bead, which is quite difficult to view. Anybody? Right, okay, is the external meatus just like the channel tunnel with a little bend? It's not just a channel tunnel, is it? Do any of you come across a thing called the anterior recess? So the ear canal is like a canal, but then the inferior wall tips away a bit like a, uh, the cliff, okay? And the eardrum that joins this deep part of the cliff there's a V-shaped recess, okay? So if you tip over and the eardrum is here, you have a recess, a bit like this. So the ear canal is up here, you look here, eardrum is here, and in this bit is the recess where my nose is at the moment. And if you look along the ear canal, you won't necessarily see a foreign body in the anterior recess. OK, so you need to adjust your otoscope or the microscope to see if you can view that anterior recess. So it's anterior and it dips away. The ear canal dips away and there's a recess, a bit like the um, 
uh, epiglottis and the tongue. You know, you have the tongue, then you have the epiglottis. Okay. And there's this recess, and you need to look very carefully for pathology there. It's the same in the ear. Okay, ear canal runs straight and then it dips down anteriorly to produce this recess. Everybody clear on the anterior recess? Yeah? Everybody clear? Yes or no? Hmm, no response. <laughs> clear, okay, fine, okay, very good. Let's move to the next one. Any questions on foreign bodies? Anything that anybody wishes to ask? You happy? Okay, let's move to the next one. Okay, here's a little picture of the esophagus, the stomach, and the first part of the intestine, the duodenum. Um, so reflux, that's stomach contents coming back into the esophagus and possibly into the pharynx, consists of what? It consists of bile, stomach enzymes and acid. OK, and in the UK, this reflux is classically called gastroesophageal reflux disorder or disease, GORD. In America, it's GERD, G-E-R-D, because they spell esophagus with an E rather than an O. But GORD, can you list the sort of symptoms that gastroesophageal reflux might produce? And some of you may have suffered this. Okay. What's the symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disorder? Retrosternal burning pain, often triggered by eating. Yep. Does any, is it worse at any time of day? Is there any time of day where it's worse or tends to be worse? Remember, the stomach contents need to get into the esophagus. So what position do you think it's likely to happen, particularly if the gastroesophageal sphincter is incompetent? Yeah, it tends to be worse at night. It's quite unpleasant. OK, and you get this searing, burning pain in the retrosternal area. OK, worse after meals, worse at night. It's more common if you smoke and you're overweight. OK, and it can be brought on by certain types of food, oily or uh, spicy food. OK, that's the classical gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, and if you're happy with that symptom, you you can treat it with proton pumped in inhibitors, plus maybe something like Gaviscon, which neutralizes the acid and the enzymes. PPIs tend to reduce the secretion as opposed to neutralizing it. So the mechanism of action between Gaviscon and alginate is different to a po proton pump inhibitor. OK, um, many times it's related to a slightly incompetent gastroesophageal sphincter here. OK, and it can be very severe. I've had gastroesophageal reflux disease myself. Um, and it's also associated with what bug? Always worth bearing in mind. Okay, H. pylori and 
the general view is you can attack the gastroesophageal reflux disease uh, by giving both a proton pump inhibitor and an appropriate antibiotic. I don't know what the latest is. You probably know more of this than I do. And it's a miraculous cure. Uh, in the old days, we would be removing bits of stomach and cutting vagal nerves to reduce secretion and wondering why the patient didn't get better because Helicobacter pylori is immune to the acid. It, it bathes itself in the acid. So you need to give this uh, medium length uh, medication of anti combination of antibiotics and PPIs in order to correct that. Um, what is the other condition you need to be a little bit aware of? Once in a blue moon, you might see with recurrent gastroesophageal reflux that might affect the lower third of the esophagus. Yep, you might have a Barrett's esophagus, which is a metaplasia, so a change in the epithelial lining, uh, which uh, uh, the acid and irritation produces, and it can turn into malignancy. So in persistent gastroesophageal reflux disease, patients should probably have a gastroscopy to examine the esophagus and the stomach and particularly to exclude uh, cancer in the stomach. And sometimes you, you can also uh, visualize the lower third of the esophagus and uh, see if there's any erosive esophagitis, which is consistent with Barrett's esophagus. Um, so Barrett's esophagus is a metaplasia. It doesn't mean you have cancer, but there is a risk that you might do. And these people do require long-term follow-up and Okay, so that's gastroesophageal reflux, <clears throat> but more recently, I mean recently over the last 10 or 20 years, we recognize a condition called laryngopharyngeal reflux. So here, the symptoms are not related to the retrosternal burning pain and worse after meals and worse at night, but the symptoms are related to the larynx and pharynx. So what sort of symptoms might acid that doesn't give you the classical esophagitis burning pain here, but produces symptoms higher up. What sort of symptoms might be related to acid and bile and enzymes reaching the laryngopharynx? You may get a change in voice, Petra, yep, hoarseness, recurrent episodes of huskiness, it's not a persistent hoarseness. Obviously, you worry if it's a persistent progressive hoarseness that there is a, a lesion on the larynx. So it's an intermittent hoarseness. Anything else? Yeah, you may get an uncomfortable throat, which is variable. You don't have dysphagia or weight loss, but there is a general discomfort in the throat. Yep, unexplained. It's not due to an infection. Yeah, that's a possibility. Anything else that, any other symptoms? Yeah, you may have cough, recurrent episodes of cough, uh, which are non-productive. Um, and these symptoms might be slightly worse at night. That's true, Dr. Morali, okay? So, and also throat clearing. <clears throat> this throat clearing is a classical symptom of uh, of uh, laryngopharyngeal uh, reflux, okay? The treatment for laryngopharyngeal reflux is similar to uh, GORD, esophageal reflux. Clearly, any persistent symptoms, either with gastroesophageal reflux or laryngopharyngeal reflux requires a specialist opinion, and at a minimum, at least an upper flexible uh, aerodigestive endoscopy. Okay. Difficult one to understand. Remember that the epithelial lining of the esophagus is designed to combat acid. Okay. Uh, if you get a lot of acid, you will get these symptoms. But in some people, the reflux doesn't 
produce any symptoms due to the epithelial lining, which is much more robust, non-keratinizing squamous epithelium in the esophagus. However, as soon as you get into the pharynx and larynx area, then the epithelium changes to a modified respiratory epithelium. I mean, similar to what lines the lungs, for example. Okay, it's slightly modified, slightly flatter, but it's much more sensitive to uh, acid erosion. Okay. Does that make sense? I can't remember who, who was it that asked, asked that question. Good question. It's related to the ep Josh. Yeah. Yeah, OK, uh, well, if you get a lot of acid reflux and uh, um, an enzyme production, PPIs may be useful. Uh, I take your point, uh, Josh, Gaviscon advanced. Um, anything that neutralizes the acid would be good and you may get away with it. OK, so is the epithelial difference a good explanation? You're happy with that? Happy? Okay, let's move on to the next one. I don't know whether you've seen this picture for three key diagnoses presenting with vitigo. Remember, vitigo is a hallucination of movement or rotation. There's no actual rotation anywhere. The world is not rotating around in the in the sort of non-Galileo sense, okay, um, or Kepler sense. Um, <clears throat> so the three main conditions that you'll come up, uh, you'll meet is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, many, which is very common, so it's worth being able to identify this. Meniere's disease, which is much less common, okay, and an acute vestibular failure, which is somewhere between benign paroxysmal and many years. So there's an acute failure of one of the labyrinths. OK, now it's very easy to distinguish which one of those three. Uh, the diagnosis is likely to be. If you just ask the questions in relation to hearing loss. And the vertigo its duration in particular whether it's seconds minutes hours or days so let's look at bppv is this associated with hearing loss okay farina says no anybody else no Anybody else? Any hearing loss with BPPV? No, so no hearing loss. What about the, there's three out of six or seven that are attending the webinar. How many else are there? Kate, what about you, Kate? What do you think? Dylan? Niraj, yeah, what do you think? Any hearing loss? Anybody think there is hearing loss? No, so the consensus is no hearing loss, which is absolutely right. You do not have hearing loss with BPPV. What about the vertigo? What's special about the vertigo? It's less than a minute. Anything else special? Anybody else? Is it more than a minute? It's positional. Yep. Anything else about the vertigo? Anything else? special about the vertigo which you can induce with a particular type of test 
You remember the test? What's the procedure you can do? It's fatigable, yep. Dix Hall Pike test. Okay. You can fatigue it, and it's associated with one other feature generally, not always. You may not see this feature. Particularly when you do the Dix Hall Pike test, you may see an additional feature over and above the patient complaining of vertigo. Yeah, you may see geotropic nystagmus. So the nystagmus is the fast component is to the ear that's down. Okay. And you and it's a rotational type vertigo. So it's not usually horizontal, it's rotational. Okay. But again, it's all fatigable and adaptable. So what that type of um Positional test tells you the fatigable, positional, lasting a minute. Okay, if you repeat the test, that's the fatigability. It's less severe vertigo, less nystagmus. And maybe by the third, second, or even third occasion, you get nothing. If you get persistent vertigo and persistent nystagmus, again, this is rare, then that's a central problem. Okay. So these people are likely to have some sort of neurological issue, whereas benign paroxysmal vis uh, positional vertigo is a peripheral vestibular problem. OK. OK, so we've described the vertigo and the hearing loss. What about many disease? What's the hearing loss like? OK, do we have a hearing loss? And if, you, if, you, if there is a hearing loss, describe the hearing loss. OK, well, the answer is yes, you have a hearing loss. I think most people. Do we know what anything specific and characteristic of the hearing loss, certainly in early part of Menia's disease? OK, well, it's sensory neural, but I'm talking of clinical features. Yeah, Farina, you may get a premer, you may have an initial oral fullness, okay, or a warm feeling in the ear before you get the full blown hearing loss and obviously the vertigo, and there may be associated tinnitus. So there's a ear fullness and maybe a warm or burning feeling in and around the ear, okay, and, uh, and anything special about the hearing loss how how long does it last do you think and anything special in the early part of the disease process about the hearing loss yes farina um initially there tends to be a full recovery over a number of hours okay between the episodes but gradually the hearing does not return it gradually gets lower. It does not return to its base level and it deteriorates. OK, again, it'll be of all the many as one would see and you will not. You'll probably see one every two, three years if you're lucky. OK, um, it's not a common disease, although we always harp on about it. Um, but over a period of years, people with recurrent attacks of many years, and that will only be a handful of the total many years that you that even a specialist would come across, the hearing does deteriorate significantly. Okay, what about the vertigo? What about the vertigo? Features of the vertigo? Okay, it's it usually, yeah, it occurs with the hearing loss. Um, it lasts usually not minutes. It usually lasts hours, and perhaps all day. Usually not more than a day. Okay, recovery. 
But during that time, the patient may have significant nausea and vomiting, and occasionally these patients need to be admitted because they can get very severely dehydrated. Okay, and um, you're, you just try and dampen down the vestibular response by providing them with anti-labyrinthine agents such as prochlorperazine, you know, stematil or cinarazine or one of these other um, uh, <coughs> anti-labyrinthine agents. Uh, you may need to give it as a buckle because if you give it orally, they just vomit it out. In hospital, they may even need um, uh, parental injections of these particular drugs. Okay, so the duration of vitigo is significantly longer than um, the BPPV. Now, what about acute vestibular failure? It used to be called vestibular neuronitis. There's a number of different terms. What about hearing loss? Is there hearing loss with acute vestibular failure? Okay, Aleem, there's no hearing loss. That's, I mean, the word, the, 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 um, the, the um, term tells you it's vestibular. So you're going to get no hearing loss, but you will get vitigo. And what is special about the vitigo? So an acute vestibular failure. What, what's the characteristics of persisting meaning what, John? Lasts at least 20. <laughs> it probably lasts not even greater than 24 hours. It usually lasts several days, if not weeks and weeks. OK, and because if the one vestib vestibule is gone and only the other one is firing, the brain has to reduce the firing on that one for it to compensate. It has to compensate. The weak station and adaptation will occur in the younger individual less likely to be 100% perfect in the older individuals. So an acute vestibular failure in the elderly may produce quite catastrophic problems with mobility and balance, okay? So it's very easy to decide between the three most common conditions that you're likely to come across in terms of vitigo. Remember, vitigo is very different from imbalance OK, or feeling wobbly, you know, which could be related to cardiovascular problems or vitamin B12 deficiency or tertiary syphilis. These all have imbalance problems, not true vitigo. So it's worth spending. Half a minute, a minute trying to get the absolute description from the patient of what it is they're experiencing. OK. Any questions on on that? Happy with these three conditions? I'm not going too much into the management because the, the main essence of medicine, to be frank with you, is to get the diagnosis right. So I'm concentrating very much on the diagnostics. So happy with Vitigo here? I could ask you, you get imbalance with cerebellar act, uh, cerebellar disorders. What are the features, clinical features and clinical signs of cerebellar problems? Again, that's rare because that's a um, neurological problem, but what is, give me the features, symptoms or clinical signs of cerebellar disorder. Dystidokinesis, ataxia, nystagmus. Okay. Anything else?
What will the finger nose test tell you? The finger nose test. What happens there? Intention tremor, slurred hypertonia. Okay. It's got to be pretty severe if it's slurred speech and hypertonia and intention tremor. Patients are going to present before then. The dystidopenia kinia, is the alternate rapid movements. Okay. Palm to back of hand or playing the piano. Okay. Believe me, beat me to the rest of the mnemonic. Okay. Pass pointing and fall. Yeah, pass pointing and falling. Yeah. Okay. 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 And literally, if you're worried about the cerebellum, it takes literally, you know, 30, 40 seconds to elucidate uh, with clinical features whether it's likely to be that or not. Okay. Let's move on to the next. Okay, this is just the table filled in, which I'm sure you've all got right now. What is this? The reason I've put up this bat is uh, if you're interested in tuberculosis in humans, which part of the lungs is tuberculosis usually residing in the human? Classically, where do you get the cavitation and the lung problem? You get in the apex, Tarika. Yeah, it's usually the apex. Okay, it's up here. But what about in bats? Where do you get it in bats? This is a pub quiz question for those that are interested in pub quizzes. <laughs> Or maybe trivial pursuit if people play that game anymore. Okay. So bats, where do bats go? And they're quite TB is quite common amongst bats. Okay. Tarika, you're gonna hazard a guess? <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, base of yeah, Farina, base of lungs because they 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 both they sleep upside down. Yeah, so they get they get TB in the base of their lungs. Okay, okay, that's just an aside. Okay, this is a plain lateral X-ray image of the head. Okay, uh, so it's a plain X-ray. It's a lateral image. Okay, it's a kid. Okay, so you've got the primary dentition here, and you've got the secondary dentition, which will push these teeth out. There's primary dentition, secondary dentition coming through. So what's this top blue arrow pointing to here, this thing here? What is this? What is this pointing to? What is it sitting on? Looks like a little, looks like a mass, doesn't it? Soft tissue mass there. What do you think that's likely to be in a kid who's probably only about seven, seven years old, eight years old, according to the dentition? Yeah, likely to be a pad of adenoids. Anybody disagree? Could be a rhabdomyosarcoma, but that's rare as rock in horse manure. Okay, more likely to be adenoids. Okay. Um, what is this arrow pointing to? The lower blue arrow here.
What is that dark area? What is this area here? Obviously dark here is air. So this darkish area is certainly not radio opaque. What do you think this is? Anybody? Which part of the airway is this, do you think? It's not the larynx. The larynx is down here somewhere, Dr. Murali. It's way down here. This is just behind the mouth, isn't it? If you look at the mouth here, it's it's the oropharyngeal airway. Oropharyngeal airway. No, not a pharyngeal pouch. <laughs> pharyngeal pouch is way down here. Okay. So this is the oropharyngeal. It's, it's black. It's got air in it. Okay. It's the oropharyngeal airway. And the bit of the airway behind the nose, this is the nose here, this bit here is not black at all because it's been compromised by this lump so that's the nasopharyngeal airway this is the oropharyngeal airway and lower down which is not what this is designed to show is the laryngopharyngeal airway okay or hypopharynx okay so this is oropharyngeal this is nasopharyngeal okay so the blue arrow is pointing to the oropharyngeal airway. And what is the blue triangles highlighting? I've already given that away. These were the teeth. So given the fact this is a child, we've described the appearance here. What do you think the presenting features of this child are likely to be, could be? Anybody? Right, they could be snoring. So if you get a narrowing of the airway, wherever it narrows, it produces turbulent airflow to give you snoring. So this child might snore. Uh, somebody said breathing problems there. So snoring is a sort of a breathing problem. What is a more significant breathing problem that they might be suffering? Okay, hyponasal voice. Actually, virtually all kids have a hyponasal voice because their sinuses are not mature and aerated and large enough. So all parents complain that they have a sort of hyponasal nose, nasal voice. Okay, but it could be made worse with large adenoids. Yeah, so the, the breathing problem that's particularly a worry would be obstructive sleep apnea, OSA. OK, uh, any other way that large adenoids might present? What can't the child do if they have large adenoids? Find it more difficult. They can't breathe through their nose. And remember, humans are obligate nasal breathers. Yes, Nalisa, yeah, they get congestion. I assume you mean nasal congestion. So they find it difficult to breathe through their nose. So they're mouth breathers. They tend to be mouth breathers. And sometimes the large adenoids is due to a sort of chronic inflammation, infection. And how might that present? Not just a nasal congestion and snoring. What else might, what other clinical feature might the mother be complaining of? Best the child, probably the mother. Anything else that the mother might say the child seems to be suffering? Possibly hearing loss, okay, because the adenoids might impinge on the eustachian tube. 
um, giving you a middle ear problem, such as a glue ear, sclerotitis media, or middle ear effusion. That's a possibility. But what about the nose itself? What other symptom you may get in the nose? They can't breathe through the nose. It's sort of congested. What else you might see in the nose or the person the mother complains of? Well, a snotty nose. They end up with a chronic nasal discharge, which may well be due to um, chronic adenoiditis. And if you do a lateral X-ray, you might see this particular appearance. So, if we just step back into um, obstructive sleep apnea in children, it could be due to large adenoids, but it's usually associated with an additional clinical feature clinical sign. What's the other clinical sign? It's invariably not just the adenoids that are compromising the upper airway. What else is likely to be compromising the upper airway and causing snoring and obstructive sleep apnea in children? Anything else? It's not recurrent tonsillitis, that's unlikely. It's, it's just gonna be very large tonsils, which will get even larger if they have recurrent tonsillitis. But large tonsils such that there's in many kids with obstructive sleep apnea related to the adenoids and tonsils, the tonsils are kissing, meeting in the midline. So they're massive. The good thing about obstructive sleep apnea in children is that you can cure them. 98% you will cure with an add on adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy. In adults, it's usually not the case. You may be lucky to have between two and five, maybe 6% of adults that have a surgically operable problem that can get rid of their obstructive sleep apnea. For them, it's usually multi-level and they need a different type of approach, usually CPAP, occasionally a mandibular advancement device. So if you're going to get obstructive sleep apnea, it's best to have it as a child because you can be cured. Okay, anything, any other questions on this x-ray? Seven, eight, nine will have involuted. So when parents come to you and say to a 10 year old, I think his nose is blocked. I think this is adenoids. The chances are it's not the adenoids. It's likely to be which other common condition that affects maybe 15 to 20 percent of the population is causing the nasal congestion. Anybody has it a guess? What other common condition is going to give you nasal congestion, although the in a child who's sort of 9, 10, 11. Yeah, hay fever, John, during the summer months, but it may be all year round, in which case it's called what? It's called allergic, <laughs> allergic rhinitis, but it's, perennial allergic rhinitis, or more accurately, rhinosinusitis, because not just the nose, but the sinus will be affected as well. So it's a perennial um, uh, allergic rhinosinusitis, and the allergy might be obvious. Usually it's dust or dust mite, okay? Could be animal dander, particularly with pets lying around, okay? And the symptoms are all year round. And they end up with a congested nose with snot. The snot is really a mucus and serous secretion, okay? Seromucinous secretion, which you tend to get in allergies. Um, and it's usually not infected. Occasionally it might be a little bit yellow if there's a lot of protein in it, but otherwise it's usually clear or just mucoid discharge, okay? So 
if you get an elderly, slightly older child, it's unlikely to be the adenoids, it's more likely to be an allergic basis to their nasal issues. Okay, any other questions? We've got a couple. We just move to more general questions. Which you may have and which I might be able to address for you. So an open house on questions now. Just type the question into the chat box and I'll do my best to uh, to address it. So just general questions on ENT. Or any patient where you might want some advice. Any questions? No questions. You're all very happy with ENT. So I'm trying to finish on time for once rather than keep you an extra 15, 20 minutes. Any questions? If there are no questions, I'll sign off and hopefully you've learned a little something in the last 50, 60 minutes. And uh, good luck in your final exam. Thank you, Petra. Yeah, Any, anybody else?